As you're getting seated, I encourage you to turn in your Bible with me to John chapter 4. Come to John chapter 4 this morning where we find this account of Jesus meeting a woman at a well in Samaria. And uh, many of you have, are familiar with this passage. Uh, it's a long passage. It's one that touches on many different subjects. So we're actually going to spend two Sundays looking at this. We'll be looking at the first half today and then the uh, last part of it next Sunday. So hear now the word of the Lord as it comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a, Sam a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we turn to you this morning and ask that you would fill us with the wisdom and the truth of your word. We have many other things, O oh Lord, that bounce around inside of our minds throughout the course of the week. We have many other sources of information that this world would seek to fill us with. And Lord, we pray that you would empty us this morning of anything that is not of you and fill us with the truth of your word. Guide us, O oh Lord, we pray. Sanctify us in your truth, we pray. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you go to Waukesha and you take a stroll through Frame Park, you will come across the remains of an old spring. And the sign in front of the spring says, in part, This spring is one of the few original reminders of Waukesha's 19th century springs and resort era. A century ago, Waukesha was known as Spring City because of its many springs. Records show the presence of more than 50 springs within the city of Waukesha, and more were scattered around the county. Some of you know about this already, but 
uh, for several decades during the late 1800s and early 1900s, Waukesha was a popular tourist destination because of its springs. And I learned that it became uh, one of the nicknames for it was the Saratoga of the West um, because people were at one point in time traveling from all over the country to come to Waukesha and drink the spring water because they believed it had healing properties. One article describes it this way, quote, The marketing of Waukesha's spring water to the nation began with Richard Dunbar's 1868 announcement that he had been cured of diabetes after drinking 12 glassfuls of water in one day from an unnamed spring east of the Fox River. Sounds pretty good. Goes on to say, Dunbar later bought the property and moved his family to Waukesha. He named his spring Bethesda, and people flocked to the spring, hoping to be cured by the magic waters. Dunbar began shipping barrels of water to customers in other states. And soon, owners of other springs started marketing their water as well. And so began this springs era in Waukesha that lasted until just after World War I. Now, that's fascinating. It's not all that unique, because if you read the history books, there have been lots of times and places and spaces where people have claimed to have found uh, magical springs or healing waters that would bring healing and new life, and people would search for those things or flock to those things. Of course, none of them could truly ever deliver on those promises, could they? But the Bible says there is a water. There is a water that can bring healing to the soul. And there is a water that can and does bring new life. But you're not going to find it in a spring somewhere in Waukesha or in Saratoga or in any other place here on the planet. This spring, this water, is not found in a place. It's found in a person. And that person is Jesus. And Jesus talks about this very thing in this conversation that he has with the Samaritan woman in John 4. And we're going to look at three things this morning as we look at the first half of this story. We want to look first at the compassion that Jesus shows Secondly, the water that he offers, and thirdly, the thirst that he exposes. So first, I want to look at the compassion that Jesus shows. And the compassion of Jesus is demonstrated in this story in the way that Jesus crosses boundaries. He crosses several different boundaries that demonstrate his compassion for the lost. And the first type of boundary he crosses is a geographical boundary. Verse 1 says, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now, that last line is very interesting when it says he had to pass through Samaria. Samaria was the region between Judea in the south and Galilee in the north. It was sandwiched in between those two regions. So to go from Judea to Galilee, yes, the most direct route would have been to go straight through Samaria. However, Jews and Samaritans did not get along. And in fact, Jews had such animosity towards Samaritans that oftentimes if a Jewish person was traveling from Judea to Galilee, they would go around Samaria because they didn't want to travel through it. And so the reality is that Jesus did not have to pass through Samaria. It says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Well, he didn't have to pass through Samaria. He chose to pass through Samaria, and he intended to pass through Samaria. And that in and of itself was a demonstration of his compassion because he had compassion for the people of Samaria in a way that many of his fellow Jews at that time did not. It's a geographical boundary. He secondly crosses a social boundary. Verse 5 says, So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, and a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, you don't know much about this woman, but you can learn something about her simply by the time of day that she was visiting the well. It says that she came at the sixth hour. That would have been noon. The very middle of the day, the hottest part of the day, and that was not 
Normally, the time, women would go to a well to draw water. They would typically come in the morning or in the evening in a group together when it was cooler. The fact that she was coming in the very middle of the day by herself tells us that this woman was probably a social outcast who did not want to be seen and that this woman probably had a reputation. In other words, this was not the type of woman that you wanted to associate with. Particularly a man would not have wanted to be interacting with this woman. And yet Jesus freely associates with her and he asks her for a drink. Would have been extremely taboo for him to do that. Why does he do that? Because he had compassion for her. He was interested in her in a way that others had written her off. And yet Jesus was compassionate towards the people who everyone else had written off. So he crosses this geographical boundary. He crosses a social boundary. Thirdly, he crosses a religious boundary. Verse 9 says, The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? Well, it's not entirely true that Jews had no dealings with Samaritans, but there was a lot of animosity between these two groups. And that was, the animosity was there for a couple of reasons. First of all, there, there was animosity because of uh, their racial ancestry. Samaritans were descendants of Jews who had intermarried with foreigners after the Assyrian exile. And so many Jews looked upon the Samaritans as sort of half-breeds who weren't truly Jewish. So there was sort of a, a tension there with regard to their race, the second thing, though, was that their, their religious practices differed. Jews and Samaritans shared a lot of beliefs in common, but the Samaritans also believed some things differently than the Jews. They had their own version of the Pentateuch or the Torah, uh, and more uh, notably, they worshipped in Samaria at Mount Gerizim. There was a sanctuary at Mount Gerizim in Samaria instead of worshipping at the temple in Jerusalem at Mount Zion. And so for these reasons... Uh, the Jews saw the Samaritans as sort of people to be shunned, outcasts to be shunned. But Jesus didn't see them as outcasts to be shunned. He saw them as lost people to be loved. Uh, they needed the gospel just as much as anyone else. And so he was willing to cross whatever boundaries, whether it be geographical boundaries, social boundaries, religious boundaries, to pursue the lost with the gospel. And it's worth pausing here for a moment and just asking ourselves the question, do we model that same kind of compassion in our own lives that Jesus showed? Do the people of God today model that same kind of compassion? Uh, the compassion that should cause us to cross boundaries that would make the rest of the world maybe feel uncomfortable. Uh, the compassion of Jesus to pursue people who the rest of the world has written off. Do we have that kind of compassion? And and if we find ourselves unwilling to associate with people simply because we, uh, we have deemed them unclean or unworthy or undeserving, then we're not showing the compassion of Christ. So Jesus shows his compassion. That's the very first thing that stands out as you see this story is the compassion that Jesus shows. Now, second thing we come to is the water that Jesus offers. So after this Samaritan woman questions why Jesus would ask her for a drink, Jesus responds in verse 10. He says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, according to Jesus, there were two things that this woman did not know. He says, if you knew, that implies she doesn't know, there are two things that she didn't know. What didn't she know? Well, she didn't know the gift of God. If you knew the gift of God, what is the gift of God? Well, it's the gift of living water that he's trying to tell her about. And in, in his day, living water could refer simply to, to running water, to fresh water that was running like from a spring rather than just standing or stagnant water. But of course, Jesus is referring to something much more than just running water here. What he's referring to is the new spiritual life that is found in him. The prophets in the Old Testament talked about a day when God would pour water out on a thirsty land. Like Isaiah 44.3 says, I will pour 
water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. The, 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 the Old Testament foretold a day when God would pour out this water, this life-giving water, this new life that he would give through his spirit. And this is the gift that Jesus is talking about. And, and she didn't know this gift. He says, if you knew the gift of God, but she didn't, the second thing she didn't know is she didn't know who was speaking to her. She didn't know the identity of the one she was talking to. She didn't know that Jesus was the one who could offer living water. She didn't know that Jesus was the one who could offer eternal life. So what didn't she understand? She didn't understand the gift of God, and she didn't understand the one who offered it. And it's worth noting that today, still today, for you and me, we must know these things if we are to be saved. You need to know the gift of God. You need to know that there is a gift of living water and that this living water gives new life. Just as water gives life to our physical bodies, living water gives life to our souls. And we must know that Jesus is the one who offers this living water. He's the only one who offers the living water. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Well, she didn't understand those words. She says, sir, verse 11, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank for himself as did his sons and his livestock. She's looking at Jesus like, there's no other water sources around here, dude. <laughs> Sounds really great. You've got some other water, but uh, this is the only water source, and you've got nothing to pull water out with, so I don't know what you're talking about. Well, her eyes had not yet been opened to the realities about which Jesus was speaking. Now, she thought he was talking about physical water, and so she was puzzled. Jesus wasn't talking about physical water. He was talking about spiritual water. Jesus says in verse 13, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Jesus told her that the water in that well would not quench her thirst. In any way, shape, or form. It wouldn't quench your physical thirst because you could get water out of the well, but you'd still have to come back day after day after day. But more importantly, it wouldn't quench her spiritual thirst. And one of the central driving points that Jesus is making here and trying to get across to this woman and to us is that every single human being has a deep spiritual thirst, a deep spiritual need, a deep spiritual longing that demands to be satisfied and yet cannot be satisfied with anything else other than the living water that he offers. That's it. And Jesus says that you can try to satisfy your spiritual thirst with all kinds of other things, but they will never, ever quench your spiritual thirst. Only Jesus has the living water which causes a person to never be thirsty again. So, when the woman hears these words, she says to Jesus in verse 15, Sir, give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Well, she wants the water, but she wants it for the wrong reasons. Why do I say that? I say that because she's still thinking in terms of physical water, and so the offer appeals because she's thinking, well, maybe he has some magical water source. And that sounds pretty good because I'm tired of walking to the well day after day after day after day. And oh, by the way, she has to do it by herself and at awkward times and she doesn't have any help. So that sounds pretty good. But that's not what Jesus is offering. He's not offering physical water. And he's trying to show her that she has a much deeper need than her physical thirst. And you and I have a much deeper need than our physical thirst. That need is our spiritual thirst. And until this woman recognized this, she could not receive the gift that Jesus was offering. Until you recognize that, you can never receive the gift that Jesus is offering. Until you recognize that your greatest need is your spiritual need, you can't receive the gift that Jesus offers. So, 
Thirdly, then, we see the thirst that Jesus exposes. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Now, at first, this just seems like a totally random change in subject. <laughs> I've, I, I, I used to read this story, and I'd come across this, and I'd stumble every time because I'd say, what on earth is going on here? We go from living water, and that's like whiplash. All of a sudden, Jesus says, go and call your husband. And we're all of a sudden talking about her marital status. What does this have to do with anything? And yet, this wasn't random at all. Jesus was using this opportunity to expose her deeper spiritual thirst. I'll show you what I mean here. Verse 17, he responds to her, says, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Well, what she said was half true. <laughs> it's a half truth, sort of true. She wasn't, didn't have a husband, but wasn't the full truth because she had had five husbands and then was now cohabitating with a man who was not her husband. Can you imagine one day that you bumped into a stranger on the street and you just started to strike up a conversation uh, and they started telling you intimate details of your personal life? How weird that would be? Jesus had intimate knowledge of her past and her present, and this demonstrates the omniscient knowledge of Jesus um, and he, he revealed these details to her, specifically revealing that she had a checkered past when it comes to relationships. Five different husbands and was no, now cohabitating with the sixth man. And what does this tell us about her? Here's what it tells us. It tells us that this woman was spiritually thirsty, and yet she was seeking to satisfy that thirst. She was looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. She was trying to satisfy her spiritual thirst in relationships, and yet it could never fulfill. As I mentioned ago, every single one of us has a deep spiritual longing that can only be fulfilled by the living water that Jesus offers. The problem is that we try to fill that need with all kinds of other things. And you know, one of the primary ones, and this may be the primary one, is the number one way people try to satisfy their spiritual need today is through sex and relationships. And some people, like the Samaritan woman, try it time after time after time after time, and yet it continues to come up empty. Because no human relationship can satisfy the spiritual need that is in our soul. Only a relationship with Jesus can do that. Some people read this passage and they think Jesus is being harsh to this woman for exposing her need before, before her own eyes and before his own eyes? Was Jesus being harsh? I don't think so. By exposing her sin, Jesus was showing her her need. And as I said a moment ago, it was only when she saw her need that she could receive the gift that he offered and that she so desperately needed. So Jesus exposes before her his intimate knowledge of her past. He has intimate knowledge of her presence. How does she respond? She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Yeah. <laughs> a lot more than that, right? I think you've got some special insider knowledge here. I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she says, and again, this is going to feel like whiplash, seems like another random shift in the conversation. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Is she changing the subject here to let's get away from my marital situation? Maybe there's a little bit of that going on. But what she's bringing up is an age-old debate between Jews and Samaritans about the proper place to worship. As I said earlier, Samaritans worshipped in the north at, in, at Mount Gerizim, and the Jews worshipped in Jerusalem at the temple, and there was a debate over what is the proper place to worship God. And she wants Jesus to weigh in. Which one is it? And Jesus says, neither one. That's, that's effectively what he says. If, if I were to summarize it in one word, it's, he says, neither. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain 
nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. I imagine that when this woman brought up the question of what the proper place to worship is, she was hoping that Jesus might be a little bit impressed. Because by asking that question, she was showing Jesus that she wasn't just a, a sinful woman or, or somebody who had no interest in spiritual things. She understood uh, questions about worship, and she had an interest in worship, and she had an interest in the things of God. So perhaps she thought this might impress Jesus, this question. But once again, what I would suggest to you this morning is that this just reveals another aspect of her spiritual thirst. Because by asking this question, she was showing not only had she been seeking satisfaction in the wrong places, but she had been seeking God in the wrong places. Bible teacher David Helm writes, She, that is the Samaritan woman, thinks that she can transfer the faith she mistakenly put in relationships with other people to the places which God is said to inhabit. Many people today still seek God in the wrong places. I remember in 2006, I took a trip to Israel, and and during that trip, visited some extremely famous churches. I went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which is said to be built on the uh, place of Jesus' crucifixion and his tomb. Uh, I visited the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, which is said to be built on the site of Jesus' birth. Of course, they don't know that for sure. Uh, But as I, I watched other tourists visiting these sites, I I came to the conclusion that I think many people visit those sites every year because they have the same assumption as the Samaritan woman. They think they're going to find God in a place, in a special building. You go to the church in the Nativity in Bethlehem, there's a spot on the floor in one place where they've got this design marked out, and it's supposedly uh, that is the spot where Jesus was born. Now, of course, they don't know that. But People will travel from all over the world just to touch that spot. And what does that tell you? It tells you that I think there are many people who are longing for God and want to find him and think that maybe God is in this place or that place or that if I come to this place, then I can be brought closer to God. But what Jesus tells this woman and us is that the true worship of God is not about a place. It's about a posture. He says the true worshipers will worship the Father where? Well, no, not where. How? In spirit and in truth. What does it mean to worship God in spirit? Well, put very simply, it means we worship God from the heart. Worship is not just an external thing. Worship is an internal reality. And so if I go through external motions, whether it be religious rituals or visiting famous buildings, but I have no relationship with Jesus Christ then worship is meaningless. To quote again from David Helm, he says, we won't find the intimacy we crave by simply returning to holy mountains, sacred cities, temple shrines, remote ashrams, immaculate churches, or any other sacred places of worship. They are not what establishes our relationship with God. True worshipers must worship God in spirit and in truth. What does it mean to worship God in truth? It means that our worship must be in accord with what God has revealed about himself in his word, which means that sincere worship is not enough. Not enough to be sincere. There are many people who are sincerely worshiping all over the world today, but they're sincerely worshiping false gods and idols and objects of their own imaginations. And what Jesus' words reveal here is that not all sincere worship is true worship. Jesus says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship not at a place, but in spirit and in truth. And so the Samaritan woman had a much deeper problem than just her physical thirst. She was spiritually thirsty, and she was seeking to satisfy herself and look for satisfaction in all the wrong places and simultaneously look for God in the wrong places as well. And Jesus exposed that thirst for what it truly was. 
but she didn't fully understand still. Verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. He'll get to the bottom of this. Don't you just love that? She trusts that this Messiah figure that she's heard about and believes in, he'll sort it all out when he comes and he'll end the debate. And then with the ultimate mic drop moment in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. And I would just love to see the look on her face in that moment. She believed that the Messiah could give all the answers. She didn't know the Messiah was standing right in front of her. He had already come. And she had been searching for satisfaction. She had been searching for God and the, 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 the one who could give her satisfaction, and the one who is God himself, was standing right in front of her and speaking with her. But you know, the Samaritan woman is not so different than many people today because there are so many still today who are spiritually thirsty and who are looking for satisfaction and who are looking for God, and they're looking in all the wrong places. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you can relate to that, or you're watching online and you can relate to that that you've got a longing in your soul that you just cannot seem to satisfy, and you've tried to satisfy it with relationships, and that hasn't worked, and you've tried to satisfy it with accomplishments, and that hasn't worked, and you've tried to satisfy it with pleasure, and that hasn't worked, and you've tried to satisfy it with material things, and that hasn't worked. You're still spiritually thirsty. Well, if that's the case, it's probably because you've been looking in the wrong places. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and the one who, is, who, is, who can offer it, you would ask him. There's only one thing that can satisfy our souls, and that is the gift of God, and the gift of God can only be received through Jesus Christ. So let's turn to him in prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the one who was promised in the prophets. You are the one who is the Savior of the world, and you are the one who will return one day. And we look to you this morning, and we ask that you would give us hearts filled with faith. Lord, we all at one level or another have sought to find satisfaction in the wrong places. So draw us back to you, O Lord, this morning. Help us to see and to know and to understand that true satisfaction can only be found in you. Help us to drink of the living water that you offer. And may that become a spring of water in us, welling up to eternal life. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.